know, it's interesting how many people are women who are going through the Proverbs. This is interesting. And today we study another one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, a program that is designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis chapter one to Revelation chapter 22. We do that every year. Corey helps us do it. Corey, what are you doing today? I'm taking a look at perfume, general cosmetics, and the balm of Gilead. All right, very good. You know, that's interesting, perfume, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what did you do, Jen? A fantastic Friday question from Proverbs chapter 30, Make sure you read it ahead of time. Okay, very good. Also, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, we spent the last two days talking about some monstrous underwater reptiles and fish. And so today we're going to be looking at some amazing underwater mammals. All right, very good. Underwater is amazing. And uh, we look at that. It's going to be interesting. Let's go. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 1 through 9. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 1 through 9. You know, throughout history, the attributes of political leadership have earned an unbiblical, unbiblical reputation. Having achieved a higher rank of decision-making, there are times when it appears that leaders do what they desire whenever they want. But the Bible speaks uniquely about the role of leadership. This is in Proverbs chapter 31, verses one through nine, which we're going to read today. This quickly highlights what it means to be truly a godly leader. The wise mother speaks to the king about his role as a man in leadership. He's not to take it lightly, but is to be wise in all of his decisions. In short, she speaks of, are we ready for this word? You got to get ready for it now. She speaks of responsibility. Absolutely true. Responsibility, which everybody, including us, are trying to run from. This is something we need to rediscover in our cultural patterns of today. Leadership is not what you do because you have reached a new high in your life, but a responsibility that is taken for the good of others. Interestingly, although the writer's name is not given, it is said that to be the mother of a king, Lemuel, which, may, which many may believe to be Solomon, was to tell him the truth about what leadership is. Now, I find that fascinating because God uses women in the Bible to articulate what he's saying. And I think we need to understand that the rule of leadership, the rule of leadership is not a rule like we perceive it to be a rule, but the rule of leadership or the leading people is a responsibility. And that's something we need to revisit in our uh, escalation of uh, building up parties and all of that. We need to remember what it is to be a leader. If you have your Bible guide, turn to today's passage because this is very important. Now, let me tell you that if you don't have a Bible guide, you can get a hold of yours. We'd be happy to send it to you. If you write to us using the address at the bottom of the screen, or you can call us using the phone numbers, that's faster. 
You can get a hold of somebody, or if we're not in, just leave a message. We'll get right to you. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. And when you go to biblediscoverytv.com, click on donate. And when you make the donation, it will take you to a PDF file. And you can also write us and tell us, give us, send us a message saying, I want, you know, the Bible guide, please. We'd be happy to send it to you. I appreciate very much the donations. They help us tremendously. Now, you don't have to get a Bible guide. If you want to just make a donation, that's fine. Thank you very much in advance. Pray about it. Ask what God would have you do and just do that. We trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you. As we look at the rule of leadership, we study Proverbs 31. Most people think Proverbs 31 is about uh, the, the great woman. But, but hold on a minute. There are nine verses in front of the great woman that talk about a leader, a leader. That's important. Now, we are all leaders in some form or another. We are leading if we are Christians. And so let's pray, Father, in Jesus' name, we need to hear what you said to us. We need to know how you spoke to us. We're going to follow you, but Lord, we have to hear you. And so in Jesus' name, teach us your ways, show us your paths. In Jesus' name we said, amen. Now, look at these words. This is absolutely amazing. The words of King Lemuel, the utterances which his mother taught him. That's mom right there, brothers and sisters. Mom taught you this. What, my son? This is what she says. And what, son of my womb? And what, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Don't do that. Now, this is important because God's word says there is responsibility in leadership. Our decisions are not what we want to do, but what is best for the people. What's best for the people we serve? As leaders, we serve what's best for them. And the people need to understand that they're all leaders too. And there is a structure that God has placed and we need to pay attention to that structure because that's exactly what God is saying to us. We need to understand that he's assigned things and responsibilities to each of us and leaders and everything else. And we need to pay attention to what he said. So the mom has said, don't run around with women. Don't do all that stuff. Pay attention. Now let's go on to chapter 31, verses four and five. It says here, this is really important. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Really? That's interesting. Nor for princes intoxicating drink. Stay sober in your head. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of of all the afflicted. Isn't that something? You see, here's what we need to understand, beloved. Leaders must keep their mind right before God. You know, we don't, we don't just, you know, we don't just lead and do what we want to. Leaders must keep their mind right before God Almighty. We must be people who learn the words of God and keep them close to us. As leadership, in our friendships, as leadership in our business, as leadership in all that we do, we need to keep the word of God close to us. That's what we have to do. And so we need to understand that's exactly what she's saying. And I think that in today's world, we just kind of got loose on this and everybody just does whatever feels good, whatever makes them happy. And if you can say one line to the people that they agree with, then they'll vote for you. But if you say the wrong line, don't say that because they won't vote for you. What are we doing? What are we doing? That's not how we lead. That may be how we politic, but that's not how we lead. We have to remember to listen to the Lord and do what's best for the people. That's very important. Now let's go on to the next passage because this gets interesting. Proverbs 31, six to nine. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause 
of the poor and the needy. This is what the Bible says. And this is all before the, the, the perfect woman. See, we have to understand, beloved, that we must help the poor and the needy in this world. That's what good leadership does. We should know and act upon what the word of God tells us. This is what the word of God says to us. It says, pay attention to the poor and deal with the needy and help the people who need help. Very important. It doesn't matter. It doesn't say, you know, help the people in missions. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people in need. That's important. We must remember that. Now, with that in mind, all of us are leaders. So we need to remember, Lord, help me not, N-O-T, help me not, so what you're praying, Lord, help me not to be selfish with my income or my belongings. Help me not to be selfish. <laughs> I have a, say it, responsibility to help those in need. We do have a responsibility, beloved. We are called to be Christians, called to be people who love the Lord. If, we are, if we've said, Jesus Christ, come into my life, then we've called, we're called to follow Jesus and Jesus helped the poor. And he went after the, the widows and the orphans. This is very important for us to remember today. Well, it's time now to continue on with our study, and today I'm continuing on in our science series. Now, if you remember, over the last two programs, we've taken a look at some of the most amazing and monstrous underwater reptiles and fish. But our study wouldn't be complete without also checking out the underwater mammals. In fact, the largest creature that God ever created, as far as we know, is an underwater mammal. Let's study. Not all monsters of the sea are reptiles or fish. In fact, some of the largest of the underwater life are mammals. While many are familiar with the gentle seaweed grazing dugongs and manatees, endearingly referred to as cows of the sea, very few are aware that there were once monstrous versions of these animals. Consider Hydrodomalus gigas, or as it is more commonly referred, Steller sea cow. It is named after the doctor and naturalist Wilhelm Steller, who in 1741 first discovered and observed these creatures in action before they went extinct. Steller was on board the ship of famous Danish explorer Vitus Bering, for whom the Bering Strait gets its name, when they became shipwrecked on an island that now also has Bering's name. Stranded for months, Steller had the rare opportunity to observe herds of these gigantic sea cows, which lived in the shallow waters surrounding the islands in the Bering Sea. Over the months, the doctor was able to record many details about these gentle and peaceful creatures. Though they had rather small heads, their bodies were massive. In fact, they could grow to lengths of up to 25 feet or more and weigh up to more than 10 tons. Steller also noticed that this slow-moving beast of the sea seemed unafraid of people as it would ignore boats that came right up to it. Another extinct marine animal of monstrous proportions was the snake-like Bacillosaurus. Though its name means king reptile, it was actually a mammal and interestingly had many similarities to whales. For example, like whales and in fact all other marine mammals, Bacillosaurus gave birth to live young and suckled them with milk underwater. It is also believed that Bacillosaurus had a tail-like fluke or flipper which could move up and down. Though similar to whales in many respects, it also had significant differences. One major difference was its very long snake-like body and relatively small head. Rivaling the sperm whale in length, Bacillosaurus could grow to be 65 feet long and weigh in at anywhere between 8 to 10 tons. However, the most massive of all the marine mammals, and in fact the most massive animal in the entire world, is Balaenoptera musculus, which is actually still alive today. Commonly known as the blue whale, this massive monster can reach lengths of up to 100 feet and weigh up to 200 tons. 
Its tongue alone weighs more than an elephant, and its heart is about the size of a compact automobile, weighing more than half a ton. It contains 10 tons of blood and is so massive that a small child could actually crawl through one of its major blood vessels. Yet the blue whale breaks more than just size records. For example, it is the fastest growing animal on Earth, it migrates farther than any other, and is also the loudest, with a whistle that can reach 188 decibels. So there you have it. We've seen the most massive underwater reptiles, fish, and mammals. And isn't it great that the largest of those, the blue whale, is still with us? What a testimony they are to their brilliant creator. Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed this study of God's amazing creation over the last few weeks as we've been going through the books of Psalms and Proverbs. I don't know about you, but I have a new appreciation for the world God's made for us. Of course, it is currently marred by sin and death. But soon and very soon, Jesus Christ is coming to redeem it all. Until then, let's do all we can to take care of the creation. Corey, what did you study today? Well, I'm also going to be looking at creation in terms of the world and, and living things. But instead of focusing on animals, I'm going to be focusing on plants today. Some biblical plants that had some very good aromas and scents. Take a look. Integral to the culture of biblical Israel and Judah were the sweet-smelling spices, plants, and tree resins that created incense and perfume. As would be expected then, incense, perfume, and oil are often mentioned in the scripture, associated with the tabernacle and temple, as well as with everyday life. Perfumes and scented oils were multi-purposed. They were used in medical applications, and they were used for everyday hygiene on the skin, hair, teeth, and around the home. This created a vibrant and lucrative perfume trade of imports and exports throughout the ancient Middle East. According to biblical, Talmudic, and Greek sources, Judah had a corner on a part of this market, the manufacture of the so-called Balm of Gilead, or balsam tree. The Bible mentions its center of production being in the area of En Gedi in the Dead Sea region, and archaeological work at En Gedi has confirmed it. Just like today's manufacturers, the cultivators and processors of ancient balsam kept their process a trade secret. The balsam tree, or Balm of Gilead, became so intertwined with the nation of Judah that after the Roman suppression of Judea and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, Roman historian Pliny the Elder would brag that the balsam tree's secrets were finally fully subject to Rome, just like their nation. Despite trade secrets, the general process of perfuming was similar across the board. The incense was harvested, whether flowers, leaves, branches, fruits, or tree resin, and then processed by chopping and pressing. They were then steeped in oil for long periods, boiled, strained, and packaged. Perfume bottles were often of stone to aid in keeping the product cool and away from light. Depending on the perfume's ingredients and origins, this could be quite costly, creating a market for the every man and woman on the one end, and nobles and royalty on the other. These scents were also commonly added to cosmetics like face and body lotions, and even creams and pastes that added color to the eyes and hair. So there we have another very pleasant scented segment <laughs> about ancient biblical culture. And, and you know, when you're paying attention for these cultural elements as you're reading through the scripture, you will notice them. And for me at least, and I hope for you, having some of this information and this knowledge then makes reading the Bible more dynamic for me and more fun because as I'm reading it, all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, there's the balm of Gilead again, or there's a pleasant smelling ointment, or there's a perfume. And to have that, uh, that, that cultural under understanding of what that meant, how it was used, how it was created, how it was sourced, you know, just adds an extra dimension to the Bible that can really enliven your Bible reading and help keep you going if you're having a hard time, you know, because we all do go through those time periods where whether we're really stressed, at work or whether we have so much going on and we're not sleeping, uh, that reading the scriptures can be hard. Uh, so for me, at least, this is one of the ways that helps me keep going is just adding, continuing to add to that cultural knowledge so that when I come across something, it's fun. I know what mm -hmm. that is and I, and I can understand it. So uh, just, you know, if, if you're going through a hard time, 
take heart. It's all right. Just uh, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and keep on going. Uh, and I hope this helps adding another little tool into your Bible study tack box. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to remember that the Bible is layered. Mm -hmm. uh, what, do, what do I mean by that? The Bible is not something that uh, is read like a book. Well, the Bible is read, of course. Mm -hmm. Not like a book, not like a novel. It's not like a uh, textbook. Mm -hmm. The Bible is so far more than that, so much more than that. And as we begin to read it and understand it, we learn. For example, there are women who are very much a part of the ministry of God who are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today's passage is a so. great example of it. You know, it's uh, a woman speaks to King Lemuel and, and she talks about the first nine verses of chapter 31 have nothing to do with a woman. Only after that does it have to do with the perfect woman. Mm -hmm. But the first nine verses are very critical. And this is one example of how God uses human beings. And he, he uses the human beings on the earth to tell the story because the Bible is committed to truth. Mm -hmm. So truth is there. So I think it's important that we we learn and we begin to understand this yeah. because otherwise we're going to just read the Bible like a book. And what's really interesting too about the whole mother of King Lemuel giving him advice and, and giving him wisdom, it's the impartation of motherly wisdom here. Um, it's a, just an example of it. Of course, there's, there's mm -hmm. lots of different kinds, but it's an example is that earlier in the Proverbs, the Proverbs speaks about honoring the wisdom and, and, and following the instruction of godly parents. And, and this is an example of that right at the end of Proverbs. So it's kind of cool to tie that, mm -hmm. that thought back in. Oh, they've talked about, you know, uh, following this advice and wearing it around your neck. It's, just, it's always there. It's on you. It will adorn you if you follow it. And it will adorn your life and make you a stronger person person and a better person. Uh, and then we see, uh, you know, an example of what at least King Solomon believed to be this kind of wisdom, kind of wisdom. Yeah, of from his time. This is what it looked like. And really, we're talking about when we talk about Solomon, we're talking about Bathsheba, his mother. And uh, when you begin to understand the things that she's gone through and the things that that have she's displayed in her life, uh, and you begin to understand that women are very much a part of the word of God. I mean, I think of Ruth and I think of Esther and I think of Deborah and the people who say the, the Bible is chauvinistic are commenting on the people in the Bible who the culture, are chauvinistic. So they're, they're the culture was, is chauvinistic yeah. and the Bible confronts that, but yeah. it doesn't confront it like we would confront yeah. it. It just tells the truth about it. Yeah. It's like slavery. Yeah. The Bible doesn't endorse slavery. It says at the beginning of the Bible, man shall not have dominion over man, mm -hmm. but man has dominion over the creatures of the earth. Mm -hmm. Never once does the Bible say man shall have dominion over man, but what it does do is confronts people and says, when you're you're in this situation, so when you're in this situation, treat them like a human being, mm -hmm. understand them. And so a lot of people don't understand that and they, they don't know how, and they, they, they think they have to defend the Bible by saying this or saying that, but no, the Bible is not a book. It's a, it's more than a book. It's the Holy Spirit of God. It's the essence of who God is. John 1 tells us that. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. And I think that if we remember that in the beginning was the word, the logos, as it is said in Greek, um, then people begin to understand the active word of God. It's not like a word, but it's the active word of God. Mm -hmm. That's what logos is, the active word of God. It says nothing was created without him, and in him was the word of God, and he was the word of God. And that's really why we do what we do and can continue year after year. Next year Absolutely. will be the 30th year of this program taking people through the Bible. And, and you might think, well, you know, you, how boring is that? I'm not going to watch again next year because it's going to be the same thing. The thing is, we don't repeat the material. And you say, well, how can you do that for 30 years with the same book? Exactly. <laughs> because it's not just a book. It is multidimensional and, and every year. Every time we go through the scriptures, there's more material and new things that, that jumps out. The principles don't change. Uh, God's statutes don't change. Uh, he doesn't change. But the different elements, the things, Corey, that you draw out historically and culturally, Ryan, the, the apologetics and, the, and, and, and the, the things surrounding the sciences, and as new things are developing within our world, things are lining up 
with scripture. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we see that with archeology span and it just becomes more and more exciting and, and new discoveries and, and the way that the worldly science seems to change in its results when you base your fact on what we read in scripture, that's what keeps us grounded. That's the foundation from which we come. So it's a very exciting time. And what would we do without our fantastic Friday question? <laughs> <laughs> that has say, a segue what into would we do? the question. <laughs> what uh, would you were we setting do? it up and you did it perfectly. What would we do? <laughs> All right, so this is a fill in the blank. It's a finish the verse. All right, and it's coming to us from Proverbs 30, and I almost gave the reference, and I thought, I'm not going to because that will tempt people to <laughs> check the answer yeah. before given. All right, so every word of God is pure. He is a what to those who put their trust in him? I think it's a multiple choice? Shield. No, no multiple choice. This is a finish the verse. That's okay. I think yeah. I know. I think yeah. it's a shield, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going with shield. We're going with shield. I wonder what Ben is thinking or Marinette and Sinclair or even Bobby. I wonder what, Good question, what guys. Uh, answers they're coming up with. Well, Let's put it to rest. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Very good. I think that is excellent. Very good. And by the way, uh, thank you so much for all of the work that uh, you do in, in praying for us and all yes. of that. Praying for us is a big deal. And pray for the people who watch us and the people, if you're watching right now and you're not a Christian or a believer and you think we're kind of off the scale here, we're weird, uh, that's okay, just keep watching and maybe we are weird, but the important part is that people see Jesus Christ through this program. I think that's important. And as we present the Word of God on a regular basis, I believe that the personality of Jesus Christ will come through the Word of God, not through us, but through the Word of God. That's very, very important.